Um, now, are you, are you talking about the ones with the sunglasses? Yes. Okay, so those aren't squibs. Those are actually this technique of, uh, you know, firing the condoms of blood oh. shotgun at them. Um, because you couldn't put squibs under those. They're wearing just kind of T-shirts. Yeah, like. now that I look at it, I can see them. I would wonder how that would happen. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, <laughs> looking back and sounding silly, you know, this was going to be some, you know, interpretive dance with some, you know, sort of comment on the violence uh, that was going on in the choreographer. Because the lead character is a choreographer in the film. And... Um, He's creating these dances while all this mayhem is going on in his personal life. And so that was supposed to be uh, reflected in his work. And uh, obviously, none of that actually is understood by the audience watching the film, but that's, that was the intent. City Lights movies generally don't have a uh, subtext to them. <laughs> uh, yes, that's, that's true. And then, of course, with Dance or Die, there was the song Dance or Die, which I assume was produced by um, PM composer John Gonzalez. John Gonzalez, who did, God, I don't know, 50 movies or something, or, um, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <I don't, laughs> well, that song, that song, actually, it's going to open up the podcast. So, <laughs> did... did did well, John just come? For that one. <laughs> did John just come to you uh, when you guys were in post and say, "I have a song for you"? Um, you know what? I think he did. I do know that for the four dance numbers, I went to him ahead of time and said, "I'm going to have four dance numbers, and you know, th this is the type of music I need." You know, um, but the song "Dance or Die," yeah, I think it was exactly that. I think. Um, <laughs> You know, he just came up with it in post. Does anyone know where John came from? Because I would think that he may have uh, been another one of the imports from the uh, porn industry. Yeah, he was. Okay. That is where he came from. I wonder if he's still uh, working in that business today because he kind of disappeared about 10 years ago. Um, I don't know, but uh, but coincidentally uh my i have a son who's now 13 and he started playing basketball um when he was about uh nine and i ran into john at a number of basketball games and he lives in the same town i live in now oh um and he has a son who's my son's age so um i assume he's still in music but i really don't know uh, although, if I talk to him, I will ask him what he's doing now. Yeah, and pass him, uh, pass him my number because the man who composed "Dance or Die" is a friend of, is a friend <laughs> of the of the B world. The show. Yeah, of the show. Um, so, in the end, how do you think uh, "Dance or Die" was received? Did Joe like it? Um. Um. Um, well, for the foreign market, I think it was received the same as as all the others. You know, I don't, I don't think it. Um, you know, I don't think they thought it any better or any worse. Um, Joe was not a very complimentary guy to work for, and um, I, I remember one time very early on. Um, I went to him in the office and I said, um, you know, it's people are working for nothing. I mean, I, I you know, I think my salary on Mayhem was three hundred dollars. <laughs> um, and I, I, so I said to him, you know, you need to go tell people they're doing a good job. You know, you just need to say, hey, you're doing a good job and thank you and I appreciate it. And he said, if you tell them that, they'll want more money. And I said, no, it's the opposite. They're, they're, they'll be okay to work for no money if they feel like they're appreciated. And, um, and, and it just, you know, I guess there are just different business styles, and that was his. So um, I think as a business strategy, his idea was, uh, you know, sort of tell people they're doing a bad job because then you can get them to work for less money. Um, and in my own case, um, you know, I just to give you an example of what it was like. 
I did a movie called Ring of Fire, which I was told by George, who was the salesperson, that it was kind of a movie that elevated the company in the foreign buyer's eyes. Um, and But when we watched the final cut of the movie, um, we watched the final cut, he called me into his office and told me how much he did not like the movie and uh, all the mistakes he thought I made and literally in the same breath said, but I have another movie for you to do in July called Deadly Bad. I'm going to do it. <laughs> and of course, no pay raise. Oh, no, of course, no, no. Yeah, of course not. But again, you know, uh, I wasn't there for the money. And, 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 and most people were not there for the money. The really good thing about PM uh, was you could learn whatever craft you wanted to learn. And they literally had people go from PA to producer, from PA to cinematographer, from PA to director in, you know, a year or less or, or maybe two years for, in some cases. But you literally could learn any job you wanted to learn. And I thought that was actually a great trade off. You know, I mean, who else would give me the opportunity with no experience to direct a movie? And so I was willing to, uh, you know, work for no money or very little money all that time. But again, I was fortunate enough, you know, to have a, a method of earning a living at the same time. Sure, that didn't hurt. And as yeah. you, were, you were saying, people could learn their craft. And unlike with the early days of Roger Corman, which is pretty much something that can't be duplicated, the people who worked for PM, they didn't go on to make millions of dollars a year, maybe except for Joe. But um, many of them, even people that were around in the City Lights days, they came on, they learned, and now they have steady good positions in Hollywood doing their craft. Like, um, yes, absolutely. like Judy Yonemoto, who did all the makeup for the first many City Lights movies. She, I think, did all seven seasons of Malcolm in the Middle. Yeah, um, Scott McAvoy uh, went on to... Uh, Scott McAvoy and uh, Gil, Gil something, I can't remember, Gil's last name. They went on, they became the producers of... Um, uh, that Howard Stern show, Son of a Beach, and they had another. They had a couple of other shows that they they set up their own company and became television producers, which is very lucrative. I mean, yeah, there are a lot of uh, a lot of people who came out of City Lights who have careers now, uh, or City Lights at PM, who have careers now uh, because of the craft they learned there. Absolutely. And before we get going, let's hear a little bit about your post PM career in which you directed a few movies that actually it was between your, um, your PM gigs, sort of, you directed a few movies for another producer who from the very start intended on selling those films to Joe. No, no. Oops. <laughs> no, that's, are you talking about century film partners? I guess so. The, uh, the fists of iron and evil <laughs> obsession. Okay, so what happened was I the last film I did for PM was a film with Cynthia Rothrock called Guardian Angel, and uh, I was filming it at a uh, mansion in Malibu, and the owner of the house, uh, Mike Hall, who was our sound man forever, going all the way back to the second movie Epitaph, and he was Laurel's uh, husband, who's Laurel's and Mike husband. sadly passed away. Yes, yes. But um, Mike came to me and he goes, you know, the owner of this house is asking me a lot of questions about you. And uh, I was like, oh, okay. So anyway, the guy asked me to, to have lunch after the movie was over. And he wanted to form a company like, like PM Entertainment and make low-budget films and sell them to the foreign market. And uh, so I said, okay. Now, uh, unfortunately, you know, just the opposite of what happened with Joe – it turns out we got in right as the low budget <laughs> film market was right when it was on the decline and um so you know we made uh, six films um and as i say the market was on the decline and you know so i got out of it um but uh but the intent was not to sell them to Joe. It was to sell them, you know, the same way, was to try to duplicate the PM model. But we were not able to do that. 
and uh, and and at that point, either sometime after that, neither was PM. I mean, the market had, had changed, <clears throat> and and when that company ended, um, when when Century Film Partners dissolved, I then went into television. Joe was doing a television show that was on TNT called L.A. Heat or L.A. Vice. LA Heat. LA Heat, I think it was called, yeah. And um, so I went and started doing episodes of that. And, and actually, I have to tell you this, because again, this is a typical, this is so, you know, defining of PM. I went in, I was doing, this was like episode number 40 of the show or something. So they've been doing it for a couple of years. I did the first episode, I mean, I did my first episode. At the end of the episode, they come to me and they say, uh, of the 40 episodes we've done, this is the first time that a director has done an episode that we do not have to go out afterwards and shoot pickups. The episode is complete in the can as you shot it. And I was like, well, yeah, isn't that supposed to be the way it is? <laughs> you know. So anyway, they said, so we want to make you the... Uh, the, the, we want to hire you permanently as like the head director and you'll direct like every other episode and we'll give you a year contract or something like that and uh, and we'll pay you X. And X was less than what I was making on, on the per episode basis. And I said, wait a minute. So you're telling me that you want to, that I'm doing such a good job that you want to hire me uh, permanently to pay me less money? <laughs> and they were like, well, yeah, but you'd be guaranteed a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, that, that is the quintessential PM attitude, you know. You're doing such a good job, we want to pay you less, but make you work harder. <laughs> and it seems like finding work uh, got harder and harder as time went on. It did. It did get. I mean, what happened was I did. I ended up doing three episodes of that show, and it got canceled. And then I moved to a show that was on Animal Planet, and I did six episodes of that show, and it got canceled. <clears throat> and then I just hit a wall. I couldn't find work. And <clears throat> part of the problem, I think, was, um, P unfortunately, PM on the resume was not a positive. It was a negative, I think, um, you know, and, and for whatever reason, you know, I just found it very hard to get work. And, and I, you know, I just didn't want the aggravation. I was tired of calling people who didn't return my calls, you know, pitching ideas to people who had no intention of buying them. And I basically, I said to my producer friends, look, if somebody wants to call and hire me, I'm happy to work, but I'm no longer willing to do this. So I went and wrote a book called Gambling Wizards. I was just about to get I was just about to get the plug out there. Uh, it's out, it is on Amazon.com. We will link to it. It is called Gambling Wizards: Conversations with the World's Greatest Gamblers. What is this uh, book about? Um, it's a collection of interviews, seven men and one woman, of professional gamblers, all people who have uh, made tens of millions of dollars gambling professionally over at least 20 years. Uh, these are not people who like win a bunch of money one day and lose it the next. These are professional, solid professional people who do this for a living. And it covers various aspects of gambling. Some of the big poker players are in there like Doyle Brunson and Chip Reese. Um, the biggest uh, sports better uh, uses computer modeling to bet sports. Uh, same uh, guy who has made... $200 million betting horse racing uh, using a computer model. Oh. Um, a guy who runs a professional blackjack team, a backgammon player. Well, before we go, give us three tips that you as a blackjack player and author have for anyone who thinks that they are ready to uh, sacrifice some of their hard-earned money in, in a risk to get more money. Um, well... Uh, and let me just say, I know nothing about gambling, so um, 